All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea Ciccone, and I'm gonna just kick off this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, and I'm gonna pause quickly to make sure that we are recording. So Adam, give me the high sign when we are ready. We are good, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrea Ciccone, she, her, and I am on staff here at Education Minnesota. This afternoon, we will be doing a presentation with time for questions from our audience um, on negotiating compensation for training that's required under the READ Act. And this is a joint presentation between the um, between staff at Education Minnesota and staff at the Minnesota School Boards Association. Um, we are really delighted that all of you are with us today, and we are um, delighted that we've been able to collaborate on the Memorandum, Memorandum of Understanding sample uh, around the READ Act and the required training and compensation that educators can earn uh, for taking that training and for implementing the training in their classrooms and in their schools. Um, we're really delighted that we've been able to collaborate with our colleagues at the School Board Association on hopefully what we really hope is a useful tool for all of you in discussions in your district. So we are scheduled to do this presentation um, from 4 to 5 p.m., there will be time for questions as well, and we'll kind of talk about how we'll manage the um, the, the webinar itself uh, as we go. But um, we wanted to just start this afternoon uh, with, again, welcome. We're so glad everyone is here today. If you are able to rename yourself in um, the chat, it's a little bit easier for us to track questions that we may need to do follow up. So if you click on your um, the box with your name on it in Zoom, and then there should be three little dots, you should be able to rename yourself your name and district. That's always really helpful for us so we know to whom we're speaking when we um, address questions later. I'm just going to get us started with staff introductions, and I'd actually just love to kick it to my colleagues, uh, my colleagues from MSBA. So um, actually, Tiffany, do you want to go first? Sure. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Gustin, and uh, I'm the Director of Management and Insurance Trust Services at MSBA. Uh, happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, okay. Gary, yes. do you want to? Hi, my name is Gary Lee, and I'm the Deputy Executive Director for MSBA. So as I said, my name is Andrea Ciccone, she, her, and I am in the Education Minnesota Negotiations Department, and I'll kick it over to my colleague, Justin. Hi, my name is Justin Killian. I use he, him pronouns, and I am in the policy department as well at Education Minnesota, and I work on the READ Act. And Adam? Hi, everyone. Adam Janiak in the negotiations department at Education Minnesota. I use he, him, and Meg. I am Meg luger Nikolai. I'm in the legal department at Education Minnesota. And I am happy to be with everyone this afternoon. All right, folks. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, what um, why we're here today is to walk through a sample memorandum of, of understanding that was developed jointly between our two organizations in an effort to support local unions and local school districts in negotiating compensation that educators can earn under the READ Act. So what we'll try to cover um, today, really simple. We want to make sure that everybody feels grounded on the content of the READ Act and specifically not just sort of... Um, you know, the READ Act as it was written in 2023, written and passed into law in Minnesota in 2023, but also last year, legislative session in 2024, updated legislation regarding compensation that folks can earn related to training that um, is required for educators under the READ Act. We will walk through, um, we'll jointly walk through the guidance that we developed on our uh, memorandum of understanding on this compensation, and then we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can um, from the audience. This presentation is being recorded and we will disseminate it out. We will also um, be happy to answer any follow-up questions from this presentation. Um, but during the course of the presentation, if you have a clarifying question on something that is going, uh, that one of us has said, please feel free to raise your hand um, or pop that question in the chat and Adam will be monitoring questions that are coming in from the audience that are, again, clarifying questions on the content that we've just covered. And then if you have questions on the MOU itself, we'll probably end up saving those a little bit more towards the end. So please feel free to use your chat and use the raise hand function in Zoom for us to um, sort of hopefully facilitate this 
uh, presentation in a way that works for everybody and also works for people who are um, uh, who are viewing this recording afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead right now and turn this over to my colleague, Justin Killian. Um, he's a member of our Education Issues staff and worked um, alongside MSBA staff at the Capitol around uh, the first iteration and second iteration of the READ Act. So Justin, to you. Hi, everyone. My name is J Justin again. It's great to be here with you all. Um, so I'm just going to go over the history of the last two years in a very quick manner. It's going to be a kind of a 10,000 foot overview. But one of the questions we get, because many of you don't live the READ Act as much as we do in our day to day lives, uh, those of us that work in education policy, is just kind of explain how we got here. Right. Because I think a lot of the questions about what we're doing and why we're investing so many resources can be answered if we just kind of take a moment and pause and think about that history. So what you're seeing on your screen right now is a snapshot of fourth grade reading uh, proficiency in the state of Minnesota in the year 2019. And you'll see a couple things if you look at this uh, snapshot. About 50% of our students in the state of Minnesota are not reading at grade level. And then when we start breaking that down by racial demographics, you'll see that there's upwards of 20 to 25 points difference in reading proficiency between our white students and our BIPOC students in this state. We have a tremendous equity issue as it relates to the opportunity gap tied to reading. And we also have a tremendous uh, need to do something different for students because people aren't reaching the proficiency levels that we as educators have set. I would also like to point out that these scores are from 2019, which is before the pandemic that sent us all into, you know, our special um, silos and working from home. And I'm going to let you know that the test scores, while not as complete because of different interruptions from COVID-19, uh, we haven't gotten better, right, since COVID-19. These numbers have either remained stagnant or they have gotten worse. Um, so Minnesota has an equity issue that they need to address. And we know that so many of our life outcomes are tied to our reading proficiency. Um, and so this is a this is a big issue that educators have to face. So uh, with that, we can go to the next slide. Um, I also wanted to stress that this didn't just come out of thin air. Um, there were actually three or four years of work leading up to the 2023 session. Um, there was a literacy table that was started by Representative Heather Edelson and Senator Roger Chamberlain um, about five, six years ago to start talking about these issues and these discrepancies. And many of the people that are listed on these bullet points were part of those early conversations, which some of you might be familiar with produced a series of letters pilots. Uh, letters training is one of the professional development options that people have. And we started piloting some of that work uh, even before the READ Act. There are a lot of diverse education partners on this list. And if you should take a moment and know that all of these people showed up at the tables ready to discuss this issue and ready to work in partnership to try to figure out a way to solve this problem. And that took a big feat. And our legislators, both Republicans and Democrats, should be thanked. Uh, for building a collaborative environment for us to do that. And these groups that sometimes don't always work great together, works really great together. And this webinar that you're seeing is a product of that collaboration. Uh, our partners at MSBA have been really great at helping us pull this guidance together for you all. And so this remains a very collaborative uh, endeavor that we're all in. Next slide. So I'll start by just talking about the first READ Act 1.0, uh, what happened in the 2023 session, and then I'll give you a rundown of what we changed in the 2024 session. Uh, these bullet points hit some of the big changes that were made to the way we do literacy education in the state of Minnesota in 2023. Uh, the 2023 initial version of this uh, legislation changed reporting for school districts. So some of you that are at the district level that are watching this, probably remember when we were doing three different literacy reports to send to the state education agencies. Those have now been streamlined into one literacy report that districts get to do at the end of the year. We also changed screening. Uh, we made it so that we were testing students at the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year for characteristics related to reading difficulties and dyslexia. Uh, we finally put in statute a defined use of literacy incentive aid to make sure that that money was going directly to improve reading scores in the state. 
we changed the way we staff schools as it relates to literacy and, and, and made it mandatory for districts to, to really put some emphasis on hiring the right people to have to lead them towards better outcomes for students. And the two biggest, and one of which is what we're here for today, the first was there was a big pot of money that was originally put aside for districts to uh, be encouraged to switch to different curriculum um, that aligned with the principles of the READ Act. That has now changed in 2024, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then there was a requirement that about 40,000 of our educators that are currently in Minnesota classrooms would need to go through some intense professional development. And I'm not talking about the three, four hour professional development that we're used to um, seeing in all kinds of other areas. I'm talking 50 to 150 hours of professional development is what was decided. So we can go to the next slide, which will show you how this was all altered. After a year, after this was passed, you know, people had a chance to kind of digest it. And then we came back this spring and we made some, some changes. Uh, the stuff about staffing and reporting stayed the same. That pot of money that was put aside for curriculum, um, there were some challenges in getting the approved curriculum list up and running and districts um, were desperately in need of funds and resources. Uh, and that was abundantly clear in this session. So the legislat legislators said, you know what? We're gonna take back that money that was for curriculum and we're gonna send it to the districts on a per pupil basis and say, please spend this on something related to literacy. Uh, the the um, legislature also gave scheduling flexibility, allowing districts to schedule one less um, elementary school day this coming year to help um, free up some calendar time for teachers to do professional development. We changed, we added a mid-year screening, we changed some rules about interventions. There was a creation of a much needed work group to study how the READ Act can be applied to the teaching of literacy to deaf, blind, and hard of hearing students, which is an important equity step that we added to this bill. Uh, and there was an expansion of literacy incentive aid uses, which allows for the compensation of educators for completing professional development. Um, there was about $65 million in new money, right, that was sent directly to the districts this legislative session, and it wasn't even a budget year, so that's very, that's a big deal, and about $30 million of that was set aside solely for teacher compensation, which we're here to talk about today. So we can go to the next slide. There's a lot of people that have been asking, like, who's required to do this training? Um, the Minnesota Department of Education has been a very helpful collaborative partner in this. They have put out on their READ Act website the list of categories of educators that are in phase one and the list of educators that are in phase two. Um, phase one, you will see, is that we're targeting our earliest readers, right? Uh, we're targeting primary, our primary grade educators, uh, and those people are required to complete the staff training um, by July 1st of, of next year, of 2026. Sorry, I, I bumped us ahead. We're in 2024. Um, phase two, you'll notice, is a, is a big collaborative list of uh, uh, secondary educators and some other kind of uh, support specialists. Um, this group is not expected to be completed with the training until 2027. Um, we have heard that there may be changes to the READ Act that will um, change some um, professional development options for phase two. We don't know if that will actually happen or not. Um, but right now, the Department of Education is really focused on getting these phase one educators through and primarily getting our educators that work with our earliest learners through um, these trainings uh, so that we can start making some gains here in Minnesota. You'll also notice that some of these categories are kind of a little vague. So like uh, grades pre-K through 12 educators who work with English learners. Well, those many of us could make an argument that's everybody on the roster, right? Um, the Department of Education in collaboration with Pelsby is working on narrowing some of these categories down and providing more clarity, um, but they are also very responsive. Like if you send them a direct question and say, hey, do my teachers that are working in this role with this student, are they in phase one, phase two? Do they need to do this? They will definitely help you answer those questions so that you're making the most informed decisions at a local level. We can go to the next slide. 
Um, the other thing that we just wanted to address, uh, we all know that we have an educator shortage in the state of Minnesota, and this also means that our educators are jumping around and moving around a lot. It's not uncommon for teachers to move districts over the summer. Uh, and the problem with that is that if I am a second grade classroom teacher and I am in, dis in a district and I start my letters training, uh, and then I get a new job in a neighboring district and I start there next fall, and let's say that that district is doing either core or carry all, which are the other two uh, approved trainings by the Minnesota Department of Education. What we wanted to stress for you all today is that all three of the trainings, regardless of the time involved, meet the letter of the law. So if you complete one of these three trainings, then you have been READ Act certified as the law currently stands. And when you are going through the training, at the end of the training, the vendors will provide you with a certificate that shows that you've completed the training. So if I complete letters in my district and then I move to a new district and they are just starting core, I can show the literacy specialists and the literacy administrators in that new district. Here's my certificate from Lexia that shows I did four modules of letters and that I've completed 160 hours of work. And that clears that teacher. Um, they are then meeting, they are in compliance with the law at that point, and there's no need to make them redo core um, because they've already completed one of the other trainings that meets the requirements of the law. I think the next slide will say the exact same thing that I just said, but we can go there. Right. So we have the three vendors. We will, uh, the vendors themselves will be issuing the certificates of completion. Uh, so it's not the Minnesota Department of Education, it's not Education Minnesota, it's not MSBA that's saying here are your CEUs, it's the actual companies that are providing these three trainings, and they will say here's the Lexia, Lexia will say here's your completion certificate, thank you for doing letters. Same thing with CORE and same thing with carry out. Hey Justin, um, we have a couple questions around phase one versus phase two in the compensation. Uh, so we have one question. Is the funding for teacher compensation intended to be used for phase two as well? So as of right now, the money was, we don't know if there's additional money coming, right? We, the, the district, the legislature um, allocated this money, this legislative session, uh, and the primary focus was getting those phase one teachers through. Um, I suspect there will be some evaluation in the early spring about how many more teachers are left in phase two, how much of the funding is left. Um, but right now, uh, we can't say for certain that you'll be getting additional money, uh, but I can say that there will probably be conversations about such. I hope that answers your question, Carla. Thank you. We have some other questions, which we'll get to, and I'll make sure that we follow up if we miss them. All right. I'm going to touch on the funding sources. Um, on and, and Andrea and Justin have both touched on this uh, in the past, but just to kind of summarize, there's really three different uh, buckets of money uh, that school districts have access to. So the first you'll see on the left-hand side, and this is a has has been an existing funding stream for school districts, uh, which is literacy incentive aid. In the 2023 legislative session, we got some directives or some specific uses. So the the different things that, that school districts had the opportunity to use that funding for were really narrowed down to some specific uh, purposes in the in the legislature. Uh, then this year, and, and as was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, last year in 2023, there was some dollars that were set aside for curriculum. Uh, school districts, I think largely, especially districts who had already purchased curriculum and didn't have, hadn't chosen eligible curriculum uh, that could be reimbursed, asked for a little bit different uh, or expanded flexibility for the use of those dollars, which the legislature um, thankfully provided. So those dollars that were previously set aside for curriculum purchases have been expanded. Uh, and as Justin said, basically those dollars were per, um, sent out to school districts on a per pupil basis, as you see on the slide. And uh, those can be used for a variety of different things uh, related to uh, literacy incentive aid, those similar uh, purposes for that literacy incentive aid. Uh, that could include training, right? That could include uh, screeners and some other, you know, perhaps 
perhaps a, a, a literacy uh, coach. Uh, so those dollars are a little bit more flexible. But the compensation uh, bucket that you see that we're really here talking about today is that teacher compensation piece uh, that is just over $36 per pupil. Again, given to districts specifically for uh, to, to compensate teachers for getting this training. Uh, one of the other, if you want to move to the next slide, Andrea, please. As we look at the specifics of the legislation that set up that funding source, uh, this teacher compensation, uh, you'll see in the bold text under subdivision 1B, where it says a district must enter into a memorandum of understanding with the exclusive representative of the teachers uh, to provide basically how that funding is used, which is what brings us all here here today to this to this webinar. Um, the basically and then it outlines that it can be used for stipends or for payments uh, at your at your pro rata rate uh, for reimbursement in the or for reimbursement in the case where you have uh, provided that training or paid for that training on your own. If you want to go to the next slide, Andrea. Um, but really the um, it's subdivision 4B where it says the Minnesota School Boards Association and Education Minnesota are encouraged to collaborate to develop one or more model memoranda of understanding, uh, which I think is actually really interesting legislative language where the legislature encouraged us to collaborate. Um, and I can say on behalf of MSBA, I, I think that that collaboration process to develop this MOU went very well. We had great conversations. I'm not gonna say, I, and I think uh, the representatives on here from Ed Minnesota would say that we didn't necessarily agree uh, specifics on, on some of the language, but I, I really think that the MOU that has been drafted uh, really provides, uh, whether you're here today representing a school district or here representing an inclusive representative, that there are some really great options and uh, uh, samples for you to use. So I'll just touch on a couple of things here. Uh, subdivision 2, oops, sorry, go back one second. Uh, subdivision 2 has uh, establishes that this, these dollars can be carryover. Uh, and so basically kind of getting back to the question about whether it can be used for phase two, if there are remaining dollars that are not spent per year negotiated MOU uh, that are not spent now in fiscal 25, those dollars must be set aside for that same purpose. Okay, so if, if your school district gets $20,000 in these in these funds based on your, your per student amount and your MOU, uh, the terms of the MOU have the district spending about $12,000 of that, that $8,000 needs to sit in that reserve account. So that will remain in a bucket that will be set for uh, compensating teachers uh, for, for future training needs. So. Um, depending again on the on the the MOU that your school district uh, and its local negotiate uh, those dollars may be carried over for future training needs it does subdivision Three does establish uh, basically the eligibility of a teacher who has access to these funds, meaning that you need to be employed by the district, you need to be licensed by Pelsby, and you have to provide or have to uh, go through that, that training. Um, and hopefully we don't get to this point, but subdivision 4C does state that if your school district and, and the exclusive representative are unable to come to a, a negotiated agreement on that MOU, uh, the Bureau of Mediation Services and its, and its uh, mediators are available and tasked with aiding in that process uh, to come to an agreement. So, um, but hopefully we, we don't get to that point. So uh, next slide, Andrea. All right, so the MOU guidance, um, if, if we, if you, if you've, I hope you've had the opportunity to take a look at the MOU, but just to kind of give you a layout of what that MOU content is, is that the intent was that there would be sample language uh, that that you as a, as a school district and as the exclusive representative to go could go in and edit based on the specific needs of your uh, organization. And so as Andrea brings up the MOU here, um, the Anything that's in red is uh, text that we feel, you know, that you will go in and and edit on behalf of the situation that's that's in your school district. So, uh, those are the the items that we say and you know, go in, make sure that you're tweaking that, you're putting in your district number, the name of your local and so on. Uh, also the name of the training, uh, is it letters? Is it one of the other alternatives that's there? So you're gonna go through and make, make those edits. Um, as far as that eligibility laid out in statute, the, the teacher does need to be um, employed by the district in order to be eligible. So you're gonna put in start dates and end dates uh, based on that. But any of the text that you see in red on those first couple of pages, there's a, a, a script there, a superscript and a number where you can then go to the appendices that are at the end of the MOU to reference and look for samples of suggested language in order to be able to use. Uh, 
For example, Appendix 1 has the examples of the state approved training programs as well as the hours. So when you get to that point in the MOU where it says to reference Appendix 1, you're going to come and you can take a look at if you have uh, the carryall option, for example, then you would you would be looking and, and negotiating and, and working between the two parties based on uh, those suggested hours uh, in that chart. Um, Appendix 2 lays out the considerations for teacher eligibility. There are some options that are that are listed in that appendix that you may choose to review again between the the uh, the sides, the exclusive representative in the district as far as to determine what that's going to look like. So for each of those referenced areas, we provide that that option or those those alternatives in the appendix. I just want to take a second on on appendix three, which relates to compensation. There's all sorts of options in there, right? Uh, separate models to, to determine how your school district and the exclusive representative may may agree to determine compensation. This by all means is a is not an inclusive list of options. You are not required to go by uh, option any of the options listed in that MOU. You, on the, on the basis of your negotiation negotiations process, can come up with another alternative that best suits your district. So again, these were just some of the the alternatives that when we sat down in our collaboration process uh, to discuss, these were some of the options that maybe Ed, Education Minnesota had heard from their locals that they had uh, designed that plan, or MSBA from our contacts with school districts had talked to school districts who had used a similar model. So those, as we developed the MOU, were ones that we knew were boots on the ground used, but that is not to say that you're not going to come up with something something different uh, that that you can agree upon for your compensation schedule. Um, Appendix uh, number four relates to credits, uh, whether or not the, the compensation or the, or excuse me, the training that you, you choose is going to be recognized uh, as credits for lane changes. Again, there's several al alternatives in that, um, in that appendix to, to help you walk through that process. In some cases, uh, you may have negotiated language, already negotiated language in your master agreement that outlines what the process is to get perhaps pre-approved for credits to count towards a lane change um, or, or what that timeline that, it, that it's got to be pre-approved when the when the lanes are awarded. If, if a lane change is, uh, is achieved, make sure that you take a look at your existing language. And if you're doing something a little bit different for the REDAC training, make sure that you're outlining what that difference is or for example, maybe the REDAC training is going to say you have to apply for pre-approval. You know, if, if statute in this case is requiring teachers to, to go through this training, maybe you don't have to go through the pre-approval process. And the fact that you're required to be trained is the pre-approval that you would need. Or, you know, perhaps you're, you're negotiating where, where credits aren't, um, aren't awarded. Whatever the situation is, just make sure that all both parties are clear on, on how those credits are going to be handled. Finally, Appendix 5 relates to the end date. Uh, is this, you know, typically what we see is an MOU uh, is has the same life cycle as the agreement itself. So in this case, it would end it, the recommendation that MSBA uh, gives to districts is that an, that the an MOU that's attached to the agreement will end on June 30th, 2025. This may be the REDAC compensation may be a situation where you say, you know what, we're going to we're going to leave this MOU in place maybe through 2020. 27, uh, because that's the timeline of that training requirement for that phase two. Again, there is no correct answer or no absolutes, no statutory deadline on that. But just, again, make sure that that uh, as you negotiate that, that you're clear on the, the life cycle of that MOU and whether it extends beyond your current master agreement, uh, which would be June 30th of, of 2025. And Andrea is going to um, switch back to the PowerPoint. Um, Adam, I don't know if there's any questions that are pertinent that we want to interject now or. I think we're good for now. Uh, we've got okay. a little bit of a list, but they're also getting answered in the chat. We will definitely hit on them all. And if anybody else has questions at the end, remember, we will have time at the end. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay, folks, I'm going to reshare my screen in theory here. All right. So Tiffany ran through, hi everybody again, Andrea Ciccone, she, her. Um, uh, Tiffany ran through the structure of the MOU and we wanted to go a little bit into detail on the specific MOU recommendations of each sort of clause or uh, 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 set of clauses. Um, as uh, somebody who writes contract language, 
I have never been a huge fan of a long list of whereas clauses, um, but have come around to the notion that this is a really important component of, of our MOU to establish a couple of key pieces of information. Obviously, the purpose of the MOU is to fulfill the needs of statute, which require the MOU in order to dispose of the funds. There is no way for districts to um, utilize these funds. They will stay in a reserve account without an MOU signed between the exclusive representative of the teachers and a school district in order to allocate those funds out. That's the, the legal requirement or the legal trigger. So it's important that we felt to include a whereas that establishes the purposes to is to establish that these funds are, are being spent. Um, again, naming the name, uh, providing the name and the actual training that's being provided. Um, we think anybody who's reading this MOU, who's looking at this for the first time should have all that information in one spot. And then we would also really encourage people to, to include the anticipated hours of training. One note that we would have, and I imagine districts and educators are having this experience as they've gotten going in the training, it may be that the anticipated number of training hours that are listed by the provider, by MDE for Cariel or for CORE, or for letters, people may find that the anticipated number of hours of training are actually not realistic, that it's taking folks a lot longer. So we actually offer later in the MOU a contingency for that. Um, we'd also want people to think about as you establish the number of hours, especially for districts who are establishing training during a teacher's duty day, the training, say you have a, a training that you say, well, we're going to have an eight hour day where we're going to try to knock out eight hours of training. But thinking about this as you would think about how you prepare your own instruction, you know that that eight hours of um, the day itself is not going to be eight full hours of content because there is going to be a break. There's going to be introductory introduction time. There's going to be lunch, right? Um, and so one of the things to be thoughtful about is the anticipated of no number of hours that are listed in um, by MDE for each of those providers. They may not ultimately match up with the amount of actual additional uh, work or either outside or inside the duty day. So that's something for people, for the parties to keep their eyes on. Um, moving ahead, Tiffany went through the eligibility requirements uh, that are in the statute itself. We think it's really important, again, to grapple as a local district and local union with the question of not just who is required to do this training, but then you know, when they're doing it, because we have phase one and phase two uh, uh, waves of training, it would be very helpful in an MOU to lay out, this is the time, this is who is doing the training, and this is when we anticipate them doing that. If people are doing it all at the same time, if they're in wave one and wave two doing it together, if there are going to be separate um, timelines for people to complete the training, different districts are making different decisions about that. So in the eligibility clause, one of the things to really consider is just specificity about who's doing the training um, and when they're doing it. I'm going to move ahead and uh, have Tiffany talk about the, she's already, I, Tiff, you already talked about the compensation and credit recognition, but I'll pass back to you for this. Yep, I'll just uh, kind of touch base. The the one thing there's a couple of bullets on here that I didn't cover before, and and I and I do think that it's important to understand uh, that there are in, in as we talked about the literacy aid aid before that there are a couple of other other buckets that are there as well as the two percent set aside um, for for staff development that are in play. Uh, but again, the, all of those things, all whether or not those different buckets of funding come into play with with regard to your MOU is is really based on uh, a, again the negotiation process between the school district and the local. Um, I, I, I do think it's important to consider precedent, not only um, what has been done in the past, maybe regarding uh, lane changes or how things have been paid, whether it's at a, a flat, what I'll call a staff development rate that's in the master agreement or whether it's pro rata, uh, but make sure that as you're looking um, looking at this, that you're taking those things into account to make sure that there's that there's fairness across the different different training programs that you've provided in the past. You will see language also in the MOU that that basically says that this this MOU is provided for this REDAC training. And so whatever whatever language uh, is is outlined here or is negotiated here, 
uh, may or may not impact uh, the future and, and determine a past precedent, right? So just make sure that that both sides are on on the same page uh, with regard to that. And and again, I'll, obviously, we're always looking at that equity and fairness fairness from all perspectives. Uh, the the credits again, just to I, we've had a lot of questions at MSBA on this already as far as whether credits should be or can be or or will be defined. Uh, that answer may be different for for all of the the people on this on this call today and any of those who listen after exactly how what is negotiated uh, may differ with regard to how those credits are handled and that and that's okay right the whole idea of the negotiations process is to make sure that it's going to work for the for the district as well as the the teachers within your organization so again just make sure that that you're talking about those things as you work through the process Thanks, Tiffany. I'm going to talk a little bit about proof of completion and a payment timeline. Um, as we noted, in order to release the funds, there is an MOU that's required. The law lays out um, sort of three stipulations that uh, the funds that are negotiated through this MOU can be paid out at the point of um, registration for the training at the point that um, training is started or on completion. That is a decision that is up to the local um, and the district together. So those are sort of the, the, the legal framework for that. We have seen any number of different iterations of this where money is paid out on um, uh, two different allotments, um, on completion of modules one and two, and then on completion of modules three and four. What we think is key is just to ensure, first of all, that proof of completion, what that certification, or you know, in some cases, it's a screenshot showing that modules one and two have been completed from Carryall, for example. Um, it's really critical that the party, that everybody reading this agreement understand who is the district designee uh, to whom staff can provide proof of the either process, either registration um, or progress or completion of, of the training. And um, at the same time, it'll, you know, it'll be really critical, not just so people know who to whom they need to show proof of completion or or progress, um, but when pay is received. So if the intention is that people are going to complete modules one and two and get an initial installment of a stipend, um, <clears throat> the stipend is expected to be paid out within two weeks. Uh, whatever the whatever the decision that you two that the parties make locally, we, we recommend that that's included in the agreement um, as well. And we have different, the compensation appendix, as Tiffany pointed out, is lengthy because we wanted to provide a number of different sort of iterations on that. So both in the compensation section and in the proof of completion section of the MOU sample, you'll see sort of different ways to approach the language that we, that we modeled. Two other things that we wanted to mention in terms of optional items. One, I mentioned initially, <clears throat> there may be contingencies that cause the parties to come back together and have further discussion. One of the big things that we've heard from districts who have, for example, been pilots in letters programming and letters training in the past is that it was taking some folks, you know, shorter, uh, shorter number of hours, some folks were taking longer. What we're hearing initially from some of the folks who are enrolled in OLA or CORE and also carry all is that the training is um, taking longer than anticipated. And so we want to have contingency in the MOU that says, look, when that happens, here's what we do. If we're noting that this, this is taking a lot more time, um, we want to make sure that the parties have an expectation of problem solving through that together. The other contingency was also specifically laid out in state law during the 2024 legislative session, and that is a contingency about a shorter school year. Um, I think we're all familiar with minimal instructional hours that are in state law. What they did for this year for the READ Act specifically is, is they offered a contingency that uh, if the two parties agree, if the district and exclusive representative of the teachers reach an agreement, the school year itself can be shortened by a grand total of five and a half hours um, in order to accommodate read act training. Now, our understanding of this was that, you know, certainly that your typical school year, which often has many more hours of instruction than, than the minimum, does you don't have to worry about a modification if you're above the statutory minimums. If your statutory minimum instructional time were to fall underneath of that, um, if if your if your actual instructional time were to fall underneath that statutory minimum, um, it can go up to five and a half hours under. But then you do need that MOU to include agreement 
that uh, the parties will be shortening the school year and shortening the amount of instructional time. I do not, frankly, imagine, I'm editorializing a little bit, team, I don't imagine that's going to be the case for a lot of folks, but want to you know, if we have another wild winter and there comes a point at which in order to accommodate the READ Act training itself embedded within the school day and districts are finding that they do need to, in fact, shorten the school year below what the statute says is allowable, you could potentially go back in and and, and negotiate that in, a, in an addendum to this MOU. Um, but we've included language in there that that opens us up to the possibility of that um, of that new of that option just for the 2024-25 school year. Um, I'm gonna move us to the last bit of this MOU and then I believe we'll be uh, able to handle the many, many questions that are coming in. Two final components of this uh, of this agreement. There is a component here related to failure to comply with the requirements of the law. Justin covered at the beginning, this is you know, a really significant shift in um, uh, how the state is instructing districts to prepare students when it comes to literacy. And it's an, a, a very explicit instruction to uh, teachers, to educators about the training that they are required to have. And so we wanna make sure that the MOU names, this is a stipulation, the, the training is required under the law and that lack of compliance with this memorandum of agreement and the law itself can lead to discipline under the contract. And of course, we have uh, uh, collective bargaining agreements that lay out disciplinary processes. So um, ensuring that people, that both parties are clear about the requirements that the obligations that the law places on educators and districts to ensure the obligation is on the district to ensure that people are, are receiving this training. Um, so that is one component of the MOU. And then finally, as Tiffany mentioned, um, you know, an end date for this MOU. While we do know that there will be requirements, like people have to be READ Act trained, right? They have to actually meet the science of reading requirements in the READ Act. The MOU itself will have an end date. And uh, if that end date is concurrent with the, the existing collective bargaining agreement, that is through June 30th, 2025, and you need to handle like phase two training or any other contingencies, a successor MOU could be needed. You could also, as Tiffany pointed out, have this MOU run uh, until, the until all parties that are covered have completed that training. Um, and I think, again, what we really discussed over and over in collaborating to get to this sample MOU is that decision is one that you will need to make together as a local and a district, how how you treat things like the end date and how you treat things like credit completion, right? All of that will have to be handled. One thing I, I want to say at the conclusion of our guidance around the MOU is that, um, you know, thinking about read the training under the READ Act, you have the actual number of hours that people will spend completing synchronous and asynchronous training. Um, and then you have the implementation of everything that was learned during the course of that training. I believe it's the intent of the authors of this legislation to change the way reading instruction works in Minnesota schools. And so it's not when we think about this MOU and we think about all of the work that is involved with this MOU, there will probably be ex you know, ongoing discussions into the next round of negotiations and beyond about many things that come up, including changes and in practices that people are making um, to their own instructional practice as a result of what they learn in this training. So we're opening up a conversation here with this MOU about compensating people initially for the training. But I would encourage the parties to really be open to building a collaboration together around not just the training, but how the training is then used in schools and classrooms to build out literacy work um, for our students. That is, uh, our hope is to you know, model this collaboration here and to see it carry forward into, um, into districts. So that was enough editorializing by Andrea, we are going to turn to uh, try to answer as many questions as possible. And I know Adam and Tiffany and Gary and Meg and Justin have been answering questions in the chat. For now, though, Adam, I want you to maybe cover kind of quickly how you'd like to proceed with Q&A. Yeah, I think uh, what we, we're going to do a couple of things. One, I'm going to go through and make sure some of the questions that were asked in the chat, uh, we hit on and make sure we're clear on, because uh, some of you were like paying attention to two things at once and that's tough. So we wanna make sure we are clear, even though there are great answers put in the chat. 
And then if you have a, a question going forward, you can just raise your hand. Uh, and then once your hand is raised, I'll call on you and then you can just go ahead and ask that question. Uh, so we can just go ahead and focus on one thing at a time. Uh, again, some of these questions have been answered, but just wanna make sure we're clear. Uh, one question that came up a few times was the long-term plan with teacher prep. Uh, Gary and Justin were throwing some answers in there. Um, and Justin and Gary, if either of you wanna jump in here and uh, share some thoughts, but the plan is that long, that the prep programs in Minnesota um, due to changes uh, that they're required to do as well will then produce students who are not only licensed, but licensed and trained um, to meet these requirements. Justin, Gary, anything to add? Um, no, that is correct. The um, Pells, we started the process of changing the way they approve the requirements that um, teacher preparation programs need to meet to be approved to be pro training licensed reading teachers uh, moving forward. Um, but that conversation uh, is a different conversation that happens between higher ed institutions and Pelsby and the legislature. And so there's a lot of that is still being worked out. We know there's gonna be some people we miss and we're gonna try to catch as many of them as we can as we're doing this transition. But yes, the long-term vision for this is that our teacher preparation institutions, whether they are traditional at a university or non-traditional, will be embedding this training already within teacher prep so that districts aren't expected to be doing this in perpetuity. And then Justin, while we have you unmuted, uh, the question came up about ESPs. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the expectations are gonna be for ESPs going forward and what training will be provided? Yeah, we're still waiting to get further guidance and clarity on that. The ESPs have been part of the conversation, as have volunteer parent volunteers been part of the conversation since the beginning. Um, they have been mentioned in law in both 2023 and 2024. Um, in the 2024 session, there was some funding set aside for the University of Minnesota, who is the group that built um, the carry-all training to build a similar training uh, for ESPs. Uh, and that could also be used on parent volunteers, as I understand it. I think it's supposed to be between eight and 10 hours of uh, work for those individuals. And it's to help them better master the types of interventions we would use with various uh, readers that are still in um, developmental stages to reach proficiency. Uh, but we don't have any clear date on when that might be completed yet or uh, when, um, you know, deadlines for this. So I would just stay tuned and focus on what we do know at the point at this moment, which is all this stuff about phase one licensed educators. Thank you, Justin. Another question we had, um, and I don't know who on the team would know the answer. Uh, do we know when that funding Fund, the when the funds will be uh, allocated to the districts. Well, I think, it, Gar Gary, do you want to go? Yeah. MDE is indicated it's going to be by the end of October. Uh, yep. And so uh, that's when it's going to come. And someone else had asked about uh, if they can get rough numbers as to how much is coming into each district. I just looked at the what if, and they don't have that on there right now on the MDE website, but I'll see if I can find it. Gary, you know what we have from the end of the legislative session, I don't remember if it was Senate or House staff, we actually have a run of what the allocations are that we can, I will email to you separately and then maybe uh, for Education Minnesota members, the funding runs that we receive from the legislature are posted in the Read Act section of our website, and I will go ahead and get those to MSBA um, ASAP so that y'all can post those as well. They, as Gary noted, I think in the chat, they're the appropriation itself because it's one time money is based on an enrollment snapshot from fall 2023. Um, and so that's it. I don't believe that there will be like a re evaluation of the allocation, like what they're telling us in those runs seems to be like that will be the, the allocation, both on the compensation funding and the reallocated curriculum dollars. That's both those are, are both listed in the in those runs that I'll get to you. And I believe we have the estimates in our legislative recap, so I'll oh, get that go. get that posted too. Thank you both. Uh, there was another question, <clears throat> Carla, and if Carla, if you do want to uh, expand on your question, feel free to raise your hand. Carla asked, will a phase one teacher who does not complete the training by the due date be able to teach students? And then how do we handle that? 
do we want to address the due date part first and then go into any advice on how to handle it? But Justin, do you want to take this or do you want me to? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. I can, I, ask, I can ask it for you again. Uh, will a phase one teacher who does not complete the training <clears throat> by the due date be able to teach students? And then how do we handle that as the second part? Yeah, this one's a little tricky. So um, the law requires districts to make sure that these groups of educators that have been identified, that they are employed by the district, have completed the training. And the accountability mechanism for this is that the districts are submitting their local literacy plans at the end of each year. And it says, you know, I have 30 teachers that are supposed to be trained. 28 of them have completed training and two are ongoing in training. Um, I think it's expected that people are making a good faith effort to get this done and get this done on time and that districts are working with their people to help them meet that goal and then and being transparent and honest with MDE. But I do think that if there was like a medical situation or some other unforeseen circumstance in your local your district and local. I would imagine that reaching out to MDE would be your first step on that discussion to say, hey, we think this teacher is probably going to need an extra year or whatever and see what they say. Um, but your accountability mechanism, right, is that you as the employer are directing education or, or directing teachers, educators to get this done. Um, they have to do it. If they don't do it, there's a disciplinary process within their contract. And the district is being held accountable by MDE through the local literacy plan. Uh, we, would, we would agree with that, that this is something that's got to be dealt with locally and that we don't have REDAC training police running all over the place trying to find people that haven't done it yet. You know, and so to a question that Chris has out there, you know, will Pels be providing some sort of probationary period for those new teachers that are just coming in that haven't been trained, you know, Pelsby's not going to be doing that, I don't believe. And this is up to the district to say when you're hiring a new elementary teacher or someone that's required to be trained and they don't, you have to be clear about this when you're hiring them, that if they need to be trained, that is going to be a condition of employment when they're coming in, that that training is going to happen. And this is the plan in which we're going to which we're going to tackle it with. All right, thank you. Can I, may, oh, Adam, may I add to that? I think yes. one thing that um, Tiffany, Gary, and our team has talked about is the fact that there's, right, there's going to be this interim period for the next couple of years where the bulk of staff are going to get this training through district offered opportunities that the state is paying for. There will be contingencies where you have people coming in and you want to hire them and you know that they need to do the training itself. As Gary said, nobody's policing this. Um, it's just a condition of, of work in the state. Um, and it will take additional funding, right? Like it will be uh, potentially something the districts say, well, we're going to pay for you to enroll in letters. Maybe there's a, a district that's large enough to do a cohort. Maybe the cooperatives will uh, you know, be able to ultimately do this in the future. We don't know. <laughs> This is going to be this funky in-between period where some of these contingencies that we cannot necessarily anticipate um, as people get to full preparation and training with this uh, requirements of the law. And I think we at the state level will learn from districts to, who, who come to us and say, well, this is what we want to do. Does this make sense? And we can share those practices with others as well. I would also say we are going to work really hard to advocate with the Department of Education and with legislators to ensure that there are A, resources and B, agency level supports so that people who come in um, and have not been in this initial allotment of people or trained before or maybe didn't get it at teacher prep, that there is some kind of support and plan for those folks. Um, it's not something we have right now, but it is something that I think we can advocate for. There was an additional question about if a teacher is going to retire at the end of 24, 25, are they required to complete the training? Um, I'll throw out there that the uh, guidelines provided in statute say when training should begin. And Justin just talked about uh, the a little bit of vagary about like when they have to be uh, done by it, but you have a timeline after that. So if you uh, as the employer or you as the employee see that uh, 
in this process of knowing that you're going to retire within that year and um, your training wasn't scheduled, you weren't in that phase and you do not complete it, then that would be okay. But if you get to a point where it is required, then you would still be obligated to fulfill that. A couple, couple of folks have asked questions about the recording and the slides. Yeah, we're going to make sure that uh, we get all of that out there so that everyone can access those. Have we answered the question about what if there were a few, particularly I think from Brian um, from Edgerton, um, what if everyone has been paid already and trained already? Have we addressed, I saw that question. Pop we up. haven't talked about that. And we did get that question a couple of times about uh, what if folks have already completed the training prior to any of this pass. So go ahead and jump in on the answer. Okay. I can see. So uh, I see it's, this is Brian Gilbertson from Edgerton. Yes. And then we, you know, we've had this question come in um, about the, you know, great majority of teachers having been in a pilot program for letters or who where a district went and implemented earlier. The fun, I mean, the reality is that the way that this funding is triggered or allocated is through an MOU, and that MOU lays out compensation for people who have earned that. And so what what I think I would encourage people to consider is if people have, if folks have already taken this training, one of the ways we have been encouraging our own locals to look at this is all of the work that you're doing that follows the training Um can be compensated as well, right? Like if you have gone through this training and then all of the work you're doing to change your own classroom practices, your own classroom materials, um, a stipend is a perfectly appropriate way to address, you know, funds uh, either en masse for people who have um, already completed the training or individuals who completed it elsewhere. It is perfectly appropriate to use those funds. It's a local decision to use those funds, but the MOU itself is required to sort of unlock and trigger the spending of those funds. Otherwise, it's going to sit in a reserve account. Um, and so we would just encourage people to have a pretty expansive conversation, not just about the training work itself, but what is the work that educators are finding that they are doing following that training in order to um, change their own practices. And that, again, we hope is a very open and collaborative conversation. It may be something that you take some time on before you really realize what that looks like. Um, and I would you know, Justin has said to a lot of folks during the legislative session um, and then following the legislative session in terms of the money itself, um, this, I think we all, anybody who's working in public education understands that you are undervalued as it, as it relates to how you are paid in our society. Um, we are not we are not creating millionaires in the, the world of education. And so the compensation that people are earning as a result of doing this training is a recognition of a change in practice and quite an additional, in some cases, mental load that people are taking on as they work to um, to uh, approach literacy and approach reading instruction in a, in a way that may be quite different from how they were trained initially. So I would encourage that perspective. Um, it's not a tidy answer, y'all. It's not a tidy answer, but it is one that sort of speaks to the a philosophical question. All right, we have a hand up, so we will go. Oh, we no longer have a hand up. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I had, I put my question in the chat. It seems as though I'm just looking for clarification about the eligibility. Um, teachers who do not hold a Pelsby license but are still required to complete the training. And specifically, I'm thinking about my preschool teachers. I have some preschool teachers who hold a license and some that do not. And um, I'm just wondering if the language in the statute uh, excludes them from being eligible to earn the 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 um, compensation from this particular fund. Thank you. Yeah, the answer is so. This the these the stipend funds are specifically for individuals who are required to hold a license by Pelsby. So that will cover some pre K teachers, but there will be some pre K teachers who are who have a license but aren't required to hold it, and they they may be compensated out of other funds, but not out of the specific. Um, stipend allotment. If I can 
jump on that just a little bit farther. Are they covered under your teacher's master agreement right now? Oh, hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Unmute yourself. Um, they they are under the master agreement. They yep. do have special language in there. Yep, yep. And that's fine. But they're already under that agreement. So that's the way I would approach it from a from our perspective is that even though they may not have that license yet, the way pre-K is set up uh, for now, and that, you know, in four or five years, whenever that is, they're all going to have to be licensed. But right now, the district has made that choice to put them as part of the license group, and I just treat them all that way. Thank you. Okay. Next question, Jennifer, go ahead. Okay, I have two quick ones. Um, and I might have missed this. Sorry, I was multitasking. But first of all, is this um like we're waiting for a curriculum that we think will be approved, which actually also comes with all of the training. And so I think they were still working on becoming an approved um curriculum and training on, but I'm wondering, is the list complete or would we be able to get reimbursement for the training for those um, staff members or how does that work? <laughs> well, <laughs> who wants to handle that one? Justin, you know, from my, my perspective, if they're not on the list, then it's not going to fly. So it's got to be a part of the approved training, you know, but I'd have to dig into that just a little bit farther. Okay. So specifically it was Glove, Grove's learning organization and they were still working on becoming approved. They haven't been fully approved, but they haven't, they're still in the approval process. And so I don't know if they'll be approved by, well, hopefully they would be approved by the time this, the memorandum needs to be made. Um, Jennifer, are you speaking about being one of the three approved vendors for training? Like not curriculum, right? Well, they're both, but yes, I'm speaking to the training right now. Okay. Um I did not I this is news to me that Groves was still seeking to be an approved trainer on the list. Um the three that have been approved by MDE that the state currently has contracts with are the ones that they're paying for like MDE is paying to send our teachers through this so I I I it is news to me that Groves is still asking to be on that list uh, okay so I can't speak to that so then if we because right now we are training all of our teachers in Groves that teach phonics and even intervention for the upper grades but um so they need to take also like one of the approved trainings so the law requires your teachers in phase one and phase two to do one of the three that are on the list as it currently stands. Um, okay. Well, is that list forever static? Could MDE and the legislature change it? Yes, but as it stands right now, they have it. And you're the first person that's mentioned to me that they that anyone's even thinking about adding to that list. So okay, I'll go back and check with them. Maybe they cut out their training piece and just looking at curriculum now. <laughs> Um, but then is this training for all teacher, like all grade levels, or is it specifically for those teaching phonics? It's for everybody that is in those categories that are in phase one and phase two. So it's anyone that works primarily in reading instruction at the primary level. Uh, okay. And then anyone that works with emerging leaders at the secondary level. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so a couple questions about the funding um, being repeated and how the funding gets unlocked. Uh, so to be clear, the the funding that is brought forward uh, is contingent on an MOU being reached, uh, but it is one pot. We talked about the three different pots when we're talking about um, the one pot. And Andrea, if you could slide back to the, th the slide with the uh, three pots of money on there for everybody. Uh, when we're talking about the uh, compensation related funding, that's the column on the right. So that $36.10 per pupil, 
um, to be able to use that. And that money is to compensate the teachers for the training in whatever the agreement is. Uh, having that MOU, that dictates where, how that money gets um, used. And that money can't be used for anything else outside of that. Uh, can't be used to seed the lawn or uh, buy books or anything like that. It is intended for a REDAC compensation uh, for those teachers. All right, and we have a and bunch Adam, I'm going to add an ad I'm, as an addendum to what you just said. We the, um, This is a question that came up in the chat, and I'm going to try to uh, address it as an addition to what you said. There have been a number of questions that came up around, you, uh, you know, can the compensation funds be used to pay other people, administrators, curriculum leaders, et cetera? Um, you know, one of the things that is specific to state labor law is that you know, we represent our exclusive representative is exclusive re representative of the teachers. We can't bargain for people outside of our unit. Like we can't bargain for anybody who's not in our bargaining unit. And so the district, a district could determine that they're going to pay people using literacy incentive aid, using general fund dollars, using this reappropriated curriculum dollars. Like districts have freedom to pay people outside of our bargaining unit, either through their collective bargaining process with administrators or other people, um, or just determine that those people are earning a stipend or, or other compensation arrangements. We just, we're lo we lawfully can't negotiate those. Um, and the way that we sort of look at the law is it stipulates that this compensation funding is you know, the way that this compensation funding is allocated and the way that the law triggers its use is through negotiation between these two parties. So because we can't bargain for folks outside the bargaining unit, that makes it a little bit of a tricky discussion for us. We would obviously like to see anybody who's interacting with new curriculum, with this training, to, you know, we'd like the whole universe of people dealing with training or dealing with reading instruction for students to be familiar with the training. Um, but we can only bargain for who we can bargain for lawfully. Thank you. Uh, a few other questions. One was, will there be compensation reserved for teachers no matter what, uh, or can districts allocate that money to the other places? Again, this money can be put in reserve, but only for compensating around this statute, which uh, applies to compensating for the training for the READ Act. Adam, can I just jump in with one um, one additional clarification on that? Because I see in the chat there's been, uh, again, a lot of conversations back to Andrea's point about uh, support staff, principals, curriculum directors. So just to go back to the slide that had the, the statute on it, it does say that a teacher to be eligible for compensation is if the teacher is currently employed or contracted currently serving in a position that requires a uh, license issued by, by Pelsby. And um, I, I know Gary, we had actually had this question uh, the other day on a, on a principal because principals are sometimes a teacher and sometimes not a teacher, depending on what statute we're looking at. Uh, and in this particular situation, principals and superintendents are, are provided their licensure through the board of school administrators. And so that would not, um, would, in our interpretation anyway, would not come under this, this Pell's me, nor would the prayer professionals or the volunteers. So this, by the statute in section that subdivision three, uh, number two, that Pell's me licensure is required. So your curriculum uh, directors or, or curriculum leads, I don't know, whatever they're called in your, in your school district, there isn't a Pell's me licensure required for that. Um, and so that may, uh, that likely would not meet that that definition. But again, as as Adam had stated before, there are those other buckets of funding that could be used for that. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Do hours of training and implementation of any new curriculum also be eligible to be considered for time served towards compensation? Uh, I think when you consider the agreement that you are coming to and the hours needed, that is definitely something that should be a part of your conversation um, when you are bargaining your MOU of how it is or why the compensation is what it is. Uh, there's a number of questions in here that are talking about, well, if they've already had either you know PD time during the day or if they've already completed this, like why would they get a stipend on top of it? Well, what we know um, is that there's only so much time in a day and your educators are always taking one pot of time and putting it somewhere else. If they have other work to do, it's got to, um, you know, bump something else out and then it just creates more and more time. Uh, what this is intended to do is to help compensate, not even truly compensate at the level 
that your educators should be, but help compensate those folks. So using that money to the best you can to make sure that they get as much compensation as you can in a, in a system that doesn't even come close to compensating them the way they should. Um, it's The answer is make sure getting them the, as much money as you can, um, understanding who you have to train um, and the phases that are a part of that. All right, still scrolling. Can I add to that a little bit, Adam? Go ahead. This question has came up a hundred times now in our chat, just what you address there. You really got to look forward and not worry about what's happened in the in the past. You know, so moving forward, say now you have 50 teachers in your elementary that you've trained, and now you're gonna have two or three coming in in the in future years that need the training. Are you going to set up your staff development time to redo all this training for everyone again? I don't think you think you will, unless you're going to split all this. They may be doing all their training outside of the workday for these new teachers that are coming in. And if that's the case, that's what that money can be used for. Just to tag on to that, I, I know we have heard, and I've seen it a couple of times in the chat, where school districts have um, scheduled their their staff development days now for 24, 25 to address the training needs, right? Everybody's going to go through as a cohort and it's going to be on the schedule, scheduled uh, professional development days. And there are some school districts where the school district and the local have, a, have agreed to that schedule and they have agreed that those dollars uh, or some of those dollars, whatever whatever portion they agree to, uh, is, is going to actually be used um, to, to, to pay uh, kind of behind the scenes to pay for or offset the cost of those professional development days. But again, in those situations that that language of that situation has been agreed upon by the by the school district and the local. So the school district is, you know, hey, we're going to use the, those dollars to just offset professional development that still has to be negotiated. But that is an option where those days are scheduled for the upcoming school year uh, to use that to offset those professional development days, not to go back and, and, and claw back or reimburse the staff development fund from previous years, but where those days are scheduled for this upcoming school year. All right, thank you. Uh, Andrea, Justin, Tiffany, Gary, Meg, are there any questions that uh, you wanted to add any more insight to or uh, are we pretty resolved with all of our questions? Andrea, do you have one? There was, I just saw one that I then scrolled past again. While you're looking one- Oh, it was about um, people who go on leaves. Okay, so there was a question that was in the chat, y'all, and I'm trying to repeat for people who are watching the recording afterwards who are like, we don't know what's in the chat. Um, There's a question in the chat relating to uh, folks who cannot complete the training on the um, timeline that is anticipated by this MOU or anticipated by the district because they go either on, they go on an unanticipated or an extended leave, maybe, you know, both. Um, and what we've really encouraged people to do is to sort of address the bulk, right? Like we're not bargaining for an individual, we're bargaining for the group. And so to the best of our ability, stipulate what's going to happen for, to, for people to earn the compensation. Knowing that there will be contingencies where people are on leave, maybe um, in one example, you have a parent who goes on um, parental leave unexpectedly and then has to stay home with a child for an extended period of time. It may be that you have, depending on the vendor that you're working with, they say, well, we can't extend the timeline. We would really encourage you to reach out to, to us or to MSBA um, because MDE has been very helpful at working with the vendors to say, uh, you know, in cases where people have uh, leaves that uh, that don't allow them to complete the training within their cohort, um, we want them to extend the training deadline. We also know that if somebody started the training in one cohort and has to leave, very often there may be another cohort that they can join in the next year. Um, it's going to be one of those situations where the training does have to be completed. It can be completed partially, and then the parties will really have to work together to figure out what the plan is to continue. And what we hope we can do is advocate with the state to ensure that the seat that they're filling at this moment um, is a seat that they can sort of preserve and that the state will continue to pay for that training. But that's really going to be a, a relationship that we, I mean, we have to work that out with both MDE who has to, you know, who's contracting with these vendors. Um, Justin, I feel like you've had a lot of conversations with 
the department about this and maybe want to speak to that a little bit in terms of the flexibilities that they're trying to offer? I just put you on the spot. Yeah, no, that's okay. I was um, building a question and listening. I think I caught most of it uh, enough to speak. Um, uh, yes, um, it is my understanding that most, all three of them, once you, like, if I'm a participant in the training and I start day one, a clock starts, that vendor sets, and I have that amount of time to do it. Uh, and if something comes up, uh, I know from at least two of the vendors that you can get an extension, um, usually around $100, um, that gives you some additional time. Um, and so there are ways to be able to extend um, time for teachers to continue doing this. And so that's something you would work with MDE and the vendor on. Um, so it is an option. Yes, it will probably require additional resources um, to make that reality, but that's what we do for folks when they need us. Um, the question about grad credits keeps coming up. I've noticed in the chat as well. So I just wanted to say uh, Letters and CORE both have a partnership with an extending university with uh, higher education universities where they you can purchase credit for the training. So like you complete letters and you can go through the university they have partnered with to receive, you know, set number of hours of graduate um, credits. Um, I have spoken with the University of Minnesota and they are working on de developing the same for their training. Uh, so all three should be providing the option for people to purchase graduate or college credit for this training. And I'll just add on a little bit to the other. Oh, and Andrea actually answered it in the chat. The, the question went on a little bit. Make sure we say it out loud. Um, does it depend on what district I'm in or if I switch districts? Your MOU, it, so it depends. Uh, if you've earned credits uh, that, uh, like just Justin was talking about, that are through the accredited institution and you can take them somewhere else and then they will count, then that is great. If your MOU states that you move the lane or even your contract, how, how it currently is worded, allows you to move lane for certain things and then you are able to do that without buying the credits, then it could be that it's just good in the district you're in. Or if you did purchase those credits and they're um, then accepted at the new district, then it would count in either. So it depends a little bit. So it looks like we do still have a bunch of questions out there that maybe we haven't addressed, but uh, something that we've talked about previously is maybe because we've went over an hour already that we put an FAQ together, you know, between our two organizations. And, uh, and that'll be something that, because there's going to be more questions that'll be coming up in the next three months, you know, that we have not addressed. So uh, how about if we go that direction? We that would love like to do that. I think the, um, what we'll need to figure out is, you know, how to host like a live FAQ that we can update all the time and get updates out to everybody. And one thing I think that uh, our teams have talked about is, really in developing that FAQ, what we hope to be able to do is really troubleshoot questions that are coming in, share answers with each other so that you're getting guidance as with this MOU that we've talked about and can ship back out to all of you that there's some consensus on. Um, our goal is not to create a difficulty for um, for unions and districts, we want this again to be as collaborative as possible. And a lot of that will look like you telling us what questions you're coming up with. Sometimes it will involve getting answers from the state as well, because we know some of this is going to be new and we're going to ask guidance, ask for MDE to give us some more direction. Um, and we would also be open to doing um, another sort of you know, webinar down the road on FAQs and helping to locals and districts together to troubleshoot. So um, we can we can circle back with um, Gary and Tiffany to sort of figure out what fate, what our phase two looks like in supporting all of you in, in negotiating. If that um, looks like the chat, the chat seems to think that this is a good idea. Um, so I think we can very happily make that commitment. Just gives us another opportunity for Ed Minnesota to buy me lunch. That's good. Did we buy you lunch? We probably should. <laughs> We oh, like lunch. It's all been virtual meetings, so I just <laughs> joking around. Adam, are we in a spot to um try to I mean, I think we have this captured for the recording and we are 20 minutes over. Are we at a point where we should try to wrap it up? 
Yeah, we are in a perfect spot to say thank you all for coming. Uh, we really appreciate all the questions and uh, this is gonna help us help uh, all of you. And uh, I think this is gonna make it better as we try to transition and get through this process. Um, you know, sometimes there's hoops to jump through, but uh, what we're doing is uh, working to make that instruction better for the kids. And that's what's most important. So thank you all for coming. We will get this information out and I uh, hope you have a great night.